If you were here back in 2002, you might remember that we read these words, this prayer of Solomon's dedication, as we had our opening service of the Maple Campus. And a few months later, we did it again, because it's part of the liturgy of dedication. And, and there at the Tyler Campus, as we had the grand opening of the uh, library wing of our Tyler campus. It is an appropriate Bible reading for any church dedication in which, you know, we kind of come to God and say, hey, we built this. It's to your glory. We know that no building could ever contain you, but please come be with us now. Be pleased with what you hear and see and bless us. It was a really exciting time for us as a congregation. We got to open up this second campus here on Maple with a daycare and, oh, exciting times. And then back at Tyler, why we've got new, two new youth rooms, junior, senior high, this enormous, wonderful library, lots of classrooms, and yet it's interesting, the room that gets a lot of use is the unfinished room. I don't know. But it was just really exciting for all of us. And... Um, as exciting as it was, it really pales in comparison to Solomon and his congregation. Think about it. Church up to that point had been outdoors in a tent. But now, this beautiful, big, gold-inlaid, wood-carved, intricate, detailed, furnished well, uh, this Permanent stone structure gleamed before them in which God himself has promised to be present. And he was, you could see this glorious cloud that just filled the temple area. Amazing. Well, you know, they, they didn't build the building. And we didn't build our building simply to have a church or a temple. Any new construction always has a very specific purpose and reason for its being erected. And so there was Solomon, wise King Solomon, lifting up his hands to heaven as the entire nation of Israel stood there. And he told them, this is why we built the temple. This is its purpose. Here's the plan and ministry that will happen here. And there, um, he explained the obvious and the expected. We built the temple for us, right? Okay. So, uh, we can be with God. And, and there, being with him, oh, he, will ha he will have an opportunity then to, to share his covenant love with those who are wholeheartedly following in his way. It is a place in which God will hear their prayers, receive their offerings, forgive their sins, because after all, he is their God, the God of Israel. But Solomon went well beyond the expected. He didn't stop there. He went on to the unexpected and included the foreigners too. I, I know church is for the church people, but Solomon right then and there wanted everybody to know that there will be people who hear of the, the glory of God, his mighty outstretched hand in his arm. They will come and they will pray towards this temple. Now, Solomon is praying all of this to God. But keep in mind, the real audience for these words and petitions isn't God, but the people who've been gathered there. So that they would know from day one that the kind of God that we have, he can't be contained in this building. And the kind of God that we have... Why, his heart goes so well beyond just the family of Israel. He's the kind of God who would extend his covenant love to a foreigner and would even listen to what a foreigner has to say and do whatever the foreigner wanted. Why, that, that just completely is 
uh, out of the realm uh, of what they were thinking. And yet, this is the kind of God he is. In that his desire, his plans for the building, his plans for the entire world and its creation is so that there will be peoples all over the world who will know him and who will fear him like his own people Israel do and know that this temple bears his name. In other words, God desires that all people come and that he be their God in reverent fear that nothing else would be in that spot of God but him. Well, it's really not surprising then. It just makes sense that when word reached Jesus that a certain centurion's servant was ill and would you please come and make him better, Jesus went. And keep in mind that Jesus is after the lost sheep of Israel. That's why he came. He is the Israelites, the Jewish Messiah. And yet this foreigner has heard of the mighty hand and the outstretched arm of Jesus and has come to believe that there is no one like him in heaven above or the earth below. In fact, his faith was so big and so amazing, it shocked Jesus. And this reverent fear of this centurion says, Oh, don't come into my house. I have, I have no right to invite you to do anything for me. Just wherever you're at, give the word and command of authority. My servant will be well. Think for a moment. This is not just a casual foreigner. Somebody who's traveled a long way just to be at the temple. He's a representative of the military occupational force that is oppressing God's people. Not a foreigner. He's an enemy foreigner. And yet look what kind of God we have who would include this kind of outsider into his covenant love through his Messiah, Jesus. The outsider becomes the insider. And so keep in mind and let it never be far from your own understanding that you and I are, were foreigners too. Even enemy foreigners to God's ways. We had no prior claim to the God of Israel because of our ancestries. We had no... Um, no right to come to Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and ask him to do anything for us. But because he is the kind of God he is, he hears our desperate cry of a prayer. And God the Father has done whatever was necessary, even giving his son Jesus into death, even death on a cross for us so that we might be included and join in his covenant people of love so that we outsiders would now be insiders so the, this is the kind of God we have this is who we are so what's the purpose of this facility well yeah it's for us that's why we're here. We paid for it. We built it. It's ours. But it's also for the outsider too, right? Right? I mean, yeah. I mean, we intellectually, we know that. And it's, it's yeah, you'd be silly not to say that's the right answer. It's like, you know, Sunday school question, it's Jesus. You know, that's the right answer. Yet, to really live... Um, with that mentality that this facility is for the outsider, ooh, that's a real challenge because it's just much easier to have church for church people. You think about it, you don't, you don't have to keep worrying about first impressions. You know, just this is how we are. We don't think about it anymore. We just come and we do our thing. We don't have to be especially nice or greet one another because, well, I know you're going to sit there, you know, and I'll catch you later, you know, and we know not to sit there because you're going to sit there. And so church people know how to do church and we, we get along just fine doing church. Imagine for a moment, though, we were the outsiders. 
Imagine for a moment that, um, and how quickly we would dismiss the insiders and their God if we came and realized just how unconcerned and unprepared they were for us. And that they really weren't expecting guests. They had no welcome, no, no way for us to really know what to do. If it was really communicated, not so much in words, but in body language that, well, you can be here if you want. But there was no way in which you could really be connected into a covenant of love. Imagine what it would be like if it was just made very obvious that the God that they worshipped really wasn't all that concerned in on this passionate pursuit to include the outsider and make them insiders to his covenant of love. Why, we certainly wouldn't travel from a distant land. We wouldn't even cross the street for that kind of house of God or his people. Scratch that one. Have in mind now, imagine that we have joined Jesus in being his answer to the prayer of the outsider. Imagine if they found a welcome and a love and acceptance, even though they are foreigners. They are completely foreign to God's ways and how we do church as Lutherans here. But they found that here there was acceptance because that's the kind of God that we have. What if they found a people who were wholeheartedly following in this way of love with Jesus? Well, isn't that the very purpose then of this place? The centurion and his servant say yes. The outsiders of ascension who are now insiders say yes. And the more and more that every last member of our congregation says yes. Well, to help you with that, I have the take home because, you know, it just, it's just, it's not easy to have this kind of mentality. And so, I'd love you to take this home and, and think about and pray, Lord Jesus, how can I help the outsider know your covenant love today? And then, I just have some general things you could do. You could write a note. You could smile. You could uh, take somebody to dinner after worship. You could let them know you will pray for them. Or you could ask how I could help. But you get the idea that this is the kind of place and the kind of God and the kind of people we are in doing these kinds of things. Because a God, the God, has welcomed us into this kind of family. Amen. Together then.